Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. You guys, right now, we are kicking off a brand new series that I am really excited about, and it's called For the Love of the Middle. So I know not everyone is in the middle part of life yet, but a lot of us are. I certainly am. And you'll be there soon enough too, right? Um, Some of you are already there and beyond. So there's really good takeaways for all of us. And if you're past the middle, bravo to you. Um, You have made it through this kind of messy time and please enjoy listening to us try to get it right. (laughs) So in this series, we're going to talk about all this stuff in the middle of life that can, that brings us sometimes the stuff is challenging, but also some really wonderful surprises and learning more about ourselves in a new way. So I am absolutely of the mind that the middle is not the beginning of a downhill slide. I think not only is there so much to enjoy here, but there's so much to look forward to still. So we're going to try to open up some of these convos around stuff like empty nesting, um, preparing for aging our own and others, by the way, caring for aging parents, obviously menopause. Um, the reinvention of ourselves, all this life change we're experiencing and more. Okay. It's kind of, this is the nitty gritty of the middle season of our lives. There comes a point where there's more in the rear view mirror than ahead. And so we're going to lean into some incredible experts for help and counsel and wisdom and advice. Also just a really robust conversation that I hope is liberating and encouraging And help us all feel a little bit seen, starting with today, because today we're talking to Mary Pfeiffer. She is a world-renowned clinical psychologist and author. She's written 11 books on a wide range of topics, but she's most famous for her breakthrough ideas, really an early adopter, on the development of the self-image of girls, younger girls, and then how older women can age authentically and happily. She was actually one of the first psychologists to call out how culture was both shaping and harming young girls in their development. Um, and she was pointing to ideas that you and I talk about now all the time, but at, at that time, this, these weren't, this wasn't even language we had as she's pointing to misogyny and sexism and, and sort of self-esteem. And, um, you know, she was a, she was a pioneer really. And so thus, This provides the perfect launching pad for Mary to now approach and help us navigate the ageism and misogyny and sense of loss that occurs when we age as women. I am noticing a phenomenon as I get older, I'm 48, that I really like getting older. And I mean that sincerely, not as a trope or as a shtick. I really like it and a lot of things about it. Now, there's some stuff that's hard and we're going to we're going to pick through all that in the series, but I like how I feel. I like who I am. I like what my relationships look like. I like how my life is starting to return to me in terms of like time and energy because I'm about to be done with the heavy, heavy, heavy parenting lift. And so I'm, I'm wanting to look at this stage and what is to come with hopeful eyes and with excited eyes. I want I want a really, um, I want a mindset that says, this might just be wonderful. Um, So Mary Pfeiffer has a lot to say on this subject and how to address some of the challenge that we're going to face, challenges that we're going to face, as well as what is awesome about what's next. She's 75. She's learned it and she has lived it and she has studied it. Um, By the way, Mary, she studied cultural anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, and then received her PhD from the University of Nebraska in clinical psychology in 1977. Um, I mentioned she's authored 11 books, including four New York Times bestsellers. And her latest book is called A Life in Light, Meditations on Impermanence. I I love this conversation and I think she's going to have that effect on you too. And I think you're going to love this conversation. So let's welcome the wise and the wonderful Mary. I'm happy to be here, Jen. So I've told my listeners a little bit about you. 
I, I high leveled it for them. But I wonder before we sort of dive into your work, would you be willing to take a few moments to tell us kind of who you are? and where you are in the world and essentially kind of the broad arc of what brought you to where you are today. Yes. Well, first of all, I'm 75. I live in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, our state capital. I'm married to a man that I met the first day of graduate school in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. He was a classmate of mine. And we planned to just be study buddies. But at the end of the first semester, we decided we couldn't be study buddies. Anymore. So we've been married. We've been together over 50 years. And I have a couple children. I have five grandchildren. I'm a caretaker of a sister, yeah. a younger sister who has dementia. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's on dialysis and she's bed bound. So wow. I understand the dilemmas of caregivers. Wow. I uh, mm-hmm. also am an activist and very involved in Uh, environmental and human rights causes here in my Mm. community. Um, I think in terms of psychology and my writing, what really set me up was um, I was an anthropology major at Berkeley and got very interested in this field of anthropology called culture and personality that Margaret Mead started. Mm -hmm. Then when I went to graduate school, and was reading uh, and studying psychology, I was struck by how culture was left out of so much Mm -hmm. of psychology. And so when I started to do therapy and when I started to write, what I really wanted to write about is this very particular node, which is how culture affects mental health. Mm -hmm. And the first opportunity actually that presented itself to me was I wrote about eating disorders. Eating disorders came into our city in the 80s, yeah. nobody had language for eating disorders. Right. Uh, women didn't understand what was happening to them. There was no literature on eating disorders mm. except some old, stale Freudian literature yeah. that did in no way comported with what I was experiencing with uh, mm. women clients. And so I wrote a, a book called Hunger Pains, The American yeah. Women's Tragic Quest for Thinness. And then the next book was Reviving, which was also about what really interests me as a writer, Jen, is when the cultural scripts for something don't match my own experience. And mm. for example, with Reviving Ophelia, what was really clear is the cultural scripts about teenage girls did not match my experience with them mm. at all. I couldn't understand them or help them using those scripts. In fact, mm. they were absolutely mystifying to me until I started mm. to think through a new script. Uh, so that that's something I feel really good about, uh, just kind of turning the attention of therapists and the culture away from the dysfunctional family model and into a much bigger sense of, of a girl poison culture in the case of teenage girls. And then later when I wrote Women Roy North, really the same thing happened. I was very aware that the the cultural scripts about older women in no way matched my own experience of being an older woman and having many older women friends. I mean, I have a million things to say in response to what you just said. First of all, I am so struck because this is now a conversation that's fairly ubiquitous. Um, We now talk at length about culture's effect on our mental health and on our body image. And, you know, this is a very robust space now. But you literally were raising the flag here when there wasn't any sort of touchstones in the zeitgeist about this. And I remember, I I was a grown adult before anybody I ever heard any of this. Um, And so you really pioneered what has now become incredible psychological and biological science. I mean, I, I, I can't, I can't overstate what vision you had at that time, I'm, I would love for you just to unpack, you know, you touched on it when you were talking about reviving Ophelia, that what you saw did not match the script. So at that time, and this is, I mean, you're at the 25 anniversary of reviving Ophelia, right? So 25 years, what was the script that you were seeing 
versus the script that you were experiencing or not seeing the yeah. script that was in the world versus what you were experiencing personally? What was the difference? Well, there were two scripts in the world. One script was sort of the dysfunctional family model that if you mm. had a child in trouble, it's because you weren't a good parent. Now oh, that didn't yes. match my experience at all because mm. the, the girls that were showing up in my therapy office had generally very good parents who were concerned yeah. about them enough to pay for a private practice therapist mm. and who were doing everything they could to help their daughters be authentic, whole people with, mm. uh, with joy and with purpose in their lives. Mm. The other cultural script was the MTV script, which was, and the advertising script, which was that girls Mm. were sexual beings and that um, what they really liked to do was um, look beautiful and dance seductively and so on. And of course, there was little truth. We're all dysfunctional parents in a way. I mean, there's little truth to that story. There's a little truth to the story that girls like to dance and look pretty. I mean, there's, Mm. they're not totally false, but actually when I had girls in therapy, what I was struck by most was they didn't have a clue who they were or Mm. what they wanted to become, or they were very much confusing their desire to belong um, and their false self with what I hoped I could help them see their own true self and their authenticity. Mm. So as I started to work with girls at first, I couldn't get anywhere because I, I didn't see this. But as I worked with them for a while, I started to understand they need help uh, seeing who they are, finding mm-hmm. their true north. They need skills for setting boundaries. They need some sense of intentionality. They need more awareness of their own choices. They need goals. They need a time perspective that they won't always be a seventh grader in junior high. Mm. And uh, one of the best things that happened as a result of reviving Ophelia, it was extremely popular book for a very long time. And I'd show up at auditoriums all over the country to speak and there'd be traffic jams. So many people Mm. needed to hear that message. But a very common thing that happened when I spoke would be a mother and daughter would come up with their arms around each other. And they'd say, before we read this book, we weren't speaking to each other. And look at us now. Wow. And that just made me so happy every Mm. time that happened. Mm. And, you know, by the way, my daughter was a teenager when I wrote Reviving Ophelia. And she was difficult to get along with. And my husband and I were doing everything we could to understand her and help her and so on. And one thing that really helped me put this stuff together was she would actually be pretty happy in the morning at breakfast when we're just talking about the day and stuff. And it was when she came home from junior high that she was a mess and grumpy. So I realized, well, I don't think this actually has to do with what's going on in our house. I mm-hmm. think there's things going on at the middle school that are yeah. taking her down. Yeah. So it all started to be uh, about the cultural impact on girls of mm-hmm. both uh, uh, the media and and the the way girls were being portrayed in the media. And then all the same kind of expectations that Simone de Beauvoir wrote in The Second Mm. Sex, you know, to stop being the subject of your own life and become the object of another person's gaze. It's a very uncomfortable experience. Well, I can just tell you as a mom, I have five kids and they range from 16 to 24 So I've had a bunch of teenagers, two of them girls, and I just can't thank you enough for your work in this because there was this um, burden of confusing shame put on the shoulders of parents who just thought I've done something wrong and I literally can't figure it out. I don't know what I did. I missed something somewhere. And now my daughter and my sons too. And of course this has a similar effect on our boys. Um, is now struggling. And so you, we really put in our hands a tool to better serve and help and come alongside our kids um, in a way that's meaningful and, and offers real possibility for um, help or recovery or progress or growth. I'd like to talk, and you mentioned it, but I'd like to talk about women rowing north. 
Yes, yes, um, yes. This series that we're in right now is called For the Love of the Middle. And we are looking at kind of life in the middle of it. Yeah, um, yeah. And we find ourselves sometimes between two generations. A lot of us are still kind of parenting and we're starting to deal with aging parents. Um, our bodies are doing all kinds of things. Like everything is different for us here in, in the middle than it was even 10 years ago, of course. And so um, the middle is interesting. And I don't find enough conversations around what it means and how to perceive ourselves. And um, you've done some really groundbreaking work here. So you contend that despite the challenges of growing older, what we're actually seeing is women flourish as they age. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I would like to hear, starting there, before we sort of drill down a little bit, what do you see and observe as some of the key factors helping women thrive? Um, And particularly, how have you seen community impact that sense of flourishing? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I think that Margaret Mead had a beautiful phrase, PMZ, post-menopausal zest, Hmm. to talk about the the freedom and renewed energy that comes post-menopause. Now, there are several things that happen around the time of menopause. One is yeah. children grow up. Yeah. Another is um, most women stop caring so much about being beautiful. And at first it seems like, oh, what a horrible thing. I'm losing my looks. Mm-hmm. But at some point it's like, oh, what a wonderful thing. I don't have to care so much about yeah. how I look. Yeah. So there's a freedom in that. Women start having more time. They start mm-hmm. having more energy. And um, they start being able to do all of these things they wanted to do all of their lives as, say, parents or highly involved women in the workforce uh, that they didn't have time to do before. So, for example, one of the things I I really love about my life as a 75-year-old is I'm very busy, but I can Mm -hmm. wake up every morning and and more or less decide what I want to be busy at. So fantastic. And what a, what a gift that Gosh. is. So, yeah. So there's a, a lot of factors. One of the things I love most about this, uh, this life stage I'm in uh, is how much more time I have to be kind to people. I'm not mm-hmm. always in a hurry. How much more time mm-hmm. um, I have to be with women friends and to pay attention to relationships. Yeah. And that's just marvelous time, you know. Oh. Uh, it you're right amazing. in the middle of Jen, you're right in the thick of it. You know, yeah. when you have five children, the age of your children, and you're working and establishing yourself as a great podcaster, you're right in the thick of the busiest time. And there's some wonderful things about that time. Mm-hmm. And every yeah. life stage has its joys and its challenges, as you know. Yeah. But um, I guess what I would argue in terms of women, uh, older than, than you and, and even into my age, is that we tend to be uh, happier as we age. We know that. There's a lot of research that women get happier as they age. Yeah. They're the happiest demographic in the world. Is we that have research right? from both hmm. Britain and, and our own country that the happiest demographic in the world is women 65 on up. That and is most amazing. People, most people actually stay very happy up until the last often two or three months of their lives when they run into wow. just they're sick they don't feel good yeah. all the time so yeah and i can totally believe that you know here's just one small example of this okay. so i was at a uh, i i'm do a lot of exercise and i was at a, a gym down at the university where i taught and most of the women using this gym were uh students mm. and grad students And I would listen to them while I was changing clothes in the locker room. And a lot of their talk was about the stress of of friends and boyfriends uh, breaking up and tension around. uh, There was a lot of talk about getting drunk on the weekends. A lot of anxiety about school and Mm -hmm. studies and grades. A lot of times some trouble with their parents at home. Financial stress. 
and also the way they would change their clothes, they would hunch over and try to be as small as they could and not let anybody see any part of their body and act very ashamed. And a lot of times they'd say things like, oh, my thighs are so big or I can't believe all this flab on my arm or whatever. So then I transferred to a, a rec center for older people with a warmer pool it was just a joy. I mean, hmm. all these women are walking around in their old underwear and they're laughing and joking hmm. with each other. Yeah. And uh, there was none of that self-consciousness yeah. about, about bodies. And most of what people talked about was pleasant. Uh, just hmm. having fun with their husbands or traveling or enjoying their grandchildren and a lot of joking. And it just really hit me. Anybody who was in these two locker rooms would be able to easily see that older women are happier than younger mm. women. That is, the, I'm going to think about that all day long. <laughs> it's so true. You're so yeah. right. The older we get there, that is such a lovely, not just hopeful, but accurate way to look at aging. This is just the fact. Oh, absolutely. It's just true. This is how it works. And it's thrilling. One of my very favorite rooms is my bedroom. I love literally everything about it. And my most recent addition to the cozy, beautiful situation in there is my sheets. I heard about Bowl and Branch sheets a while ago, and now they are the only sheets I put on my bed. I'm telling you about them because everyone deserves a cozy, comfortable bed. These sheets are just dreamy. It's like swimming in the softest ocean every single time you get into bed. Bolin Branch makes the softest sheets with a focus on the highest thread quality. They're super luxurious, but also super breathable. So they're perfect for every season and every type of sleeper. I actually had no idea how much my sheet quality impacted my own sleep quality. And I'm doing everything I can to get a good night's sleep these days. So Bowl and Branch, it is. I also love that their sheets come in colors besides white. With just a whole range of peaceful, neutral hues in all the sizes. All of them. Twin up to California King. Their sheets are also made without any nonsense. No toxins, pesticides, formaldehyde, chemicals, nothing. Okay? Bowl and Branch gives you a 30-night risk-free guarantee. Free shipping and returns on all U.S. orders. So there's just no losing here. So you guys sleep better at night with Bowl and Branch sheets. Hey, you can get 15% off your first order when you use the promo code for the love at bowlandbranch.com. Okay, so it's Bowl and Branch. That's B O L L A N D. Bowlandbranch.com. Promo code for the love. Exclusions apply and see site for details. Everyone, we did a thing. My team and I have been talking about this, we're really dreaming about this for the longest time and 2023 is the year. We are going on a cruise. The Jen Hatmaker and Friends cruise is setting sail in the sunny Caribbean from November 1st through November 5th. And I want you to come aboard. There's like, there's no better way to be at sea than with our crew. We're going to be the ultimate squad goals. Um, so look, this is how it's going to go. The Jen Hatmaker and Friends Cruise is an exclusive cruise within a cruise. So we will all set sail together on the incredible Royal Caribbean Harmony of the Seas ship. And you better believe we have just tons of fun in store. With all of the hilarious shenanigans, of course, along with some heartfelt moments and super intentional times of connection during all of our really special programming. Plus, you get to explore all the incredible activities on board the Harmony of the Seas ship. I haven't even announced who my special guests are going to be just yet. Whatever it is, you're going to love them. Bring a pal, bring the fam, or come solo because we can even set you up with a roomie. No matter what, you'll find incredible new friendships and form incredible memories during all this fun in the sun. I promise you that. So just remember, you have to register at jinhatmaker.com slash cruise with our special travel partner to get access to the Jen Hatmaker and Friends exclusive experiences, okay? So head over to jenhatmaker.com slash cruise to check it all out. Let's do this, you guys. In Women Rowing North, you have a section called Challenges of the Journey. And there are a few things that you name as challenges. Of course, like you said, every stage has ups and downs. Of course they do. But um, I wanted to hone in on what you called the worn body and intensity and poignancy. You argue that 
the worn body should be seen as a symbol of strength and resilience rather than shame. And during this section of life, women will face intense bouts of poignancy. I would yeah. just like to hear you talk about that and what you've learned and how we can also learn to celebrate our body as it gets older. Yeah, well, from my own point of view, the, the biggest uh, loss has been uh, use of my hands. And mm. I've, had, I've had a very uh, hardworking life, uh, starting when I was a girl, working for my mom's doctor's office when I was in third grade, fourth grade, and then working as a car hop at an a and and carrying these big, heavy trays around. And then nine years of school, back before we had computers, when everything's being written, Sure. Followed by being a therapist and writing all these notes for years and years, and then mm. being a writer, writing 11 books. So at some point, my hands just wore out, just wore yeah. out from overwork. And uh, it was very difficult uh, at first. I, I, uh, I've i had some surgeries and such, yeah. but I couldn't do things like, I still can't do things like open up a bag of cheese mm. or uh, open up a bottle of uh, pickles or open a bottle of wine. That's a yeah. tragedy for me to not be open to a bottle so of wine. So tragic. But uh, what happened was at first I felt just devastated by that. Mm. And that's often the first reaction to loss, devastation. And then uh, I started developing workarounds. I was very lucky. I had a partner who could open the pickle jar and so on. Uh, but I also realized I want to keep writing and my hands won't allow that. Yeah. So I started hiring um, graduate students from the English department yeah. to sit at my computer. That actually turned out to be wonderful because they were, they were also, they weren't just typists, they were editors and they all ended up becoming my friends. Hmm. And so it, it ended up being fine. And by now I don't even think people will say, well, how are your hands? And I'll think, oh, what do they mean? How are my hands? I've forgotten mm -hmm. almost that my hands are disabled. Yeah. Uh, so, but one thing happened when my hands were first broken beyond usefulness, which was I was out for dinner with a couple women friends and I was telling them how badly I felt about my hands. And they both were wise and they said, you should thank your hands for all the work they have done for you okay. these years. You should thank your hands. They have really worked hard for you. And that That's just so flipped me. That just generous. flipped me. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, almost everyone gives up some kinds of activities. As, I mean, sure. I used to be a backpacker. I can't carry a pack up a mountain. Mm -hmm. I used to ice skate and cross-country ski. Yeah. And as I've aged, my bones are such you know, it doesn't really make sense to be out there risking yeah. breaking a bone. But what happens is you find workarounds, you sure. find new activities. And part of being happy as an old person, or really at any age, because things change all the time, hmm. is being able to adapt, just figuring out, okay, this is the donate right now. This is the situation. Hmm. What is it I do in this situation to make my life as good as I can possibly make it. And mm. fortunately, there's almost always answers to those That's questions. That's true. I mean, we, we discover that if we're willing to pay attention to it and learn from it all along the way. You Absolutely. know, there's, that's, I would say that feels like a through line of just being a human. That Absolutely. something is constantly changing and it's really what we do with it that tells the story. Um, yeah. Don't, yeah. Well, that reminds me of a point, which is, we all age, but we don't all grow. And the oh, secret good. of being happy is growing and, yeah. and taking and, and successfully dealing with the challenges of, of each stage. And at one point you could say this, this, this stage I'm in is a very difficult stage with a great deal of, of loss of, of mm -hmm. people, of functioning, of, I mean, one of the greatest losses to me is, I remember a world that was very different and I miss that world. I, I yeah. it was, it was more full mm. of animals. The sky was bluer. Uh, the world was easier to navigate. I miss that mm. world. That's a loss to me. But as, as things are lost, um, the, the algebra of that is that there's more appreciation for what mm. remains. Mm. And that's if you're growing, 
That's if you're yeah, growing. And if right. you don't become better, you become bitter. You mm-hmm. either grow or you shrink. You yeah. don't get to stay the same without growing. So, and I wanted to say something about intensity and poignancy mm-hmm. too, which is um, at my age, um, the runway is short, as one of my friends puts it. And I've got a great big past and a very little future. Um, mm. But um, as I age, I find myself so easily moved by beauty or kindness. I mean, I can just be gobsmacked by mm. the way the moon looks behind a cloud or, or a friend calling to see how I'm doing. It's just beautiful. Um, and uh, mm. a lot of my life is actually uh, sending and receiving thank you cards. There's just a, such a gratefulness to be, um, to be still alive, mm-hmm. uh, to be enjoying life, and a, such a richness of relationships. We know there's research on this that depending on how long you perceive your life to be, you have different feelings of love for the world and for your life. And if you think your life is short, like for example, a person gets cancer and this one doctor I know says, you are about to embark on the most life affirming experience of your life. And that's because if you think you're going to die, you start being so extraordinarily grateful for the gifts of of life. Mm -hmm. And this whole life stage is that way. There's just Mm -hmm. such a sense of like, for example, um, my husband and I just went to Santa Fe and Taos last week. And I kept thinking on that trip, I may never see these beautiful mountains Mm -hmm. again. You know, I may never sit in Taos in a good restaurant and enjoy a a Southwestern meal. Um, I may never take a trip with my husband again, who knows, you know, Mm -hmm. but it makes all of that as opposed to sad. It makes it just extraordinarily beautiful. I love that. I feel like I could hear you just talk about that all day long. And, um, it feels, um, it's just a wisdom that you've earned and, and that you've lived. So it's self-fulfilling prophecy um, at this point, you're not speaking in hypotheticals or suppositions. This is, you know, it, and I love this. And I would love to see this conversation be far more centered um, when we are discussing women, particularly getting older. Um, as opposed to just rage against the machine, which is the message I get. I'm 48. So Mm -hmm. the message I get is absolutely rage against the machine. I mean, let's slow down time as much as we can. Let's like hang on to beauty and youth and, um, in consequently do it all. Cause it's that I'm in the do it all age, um, where it's still, everything's full throttle. Um, and so, I hope that we will start to listen to, to the wisdom of, of what really happens as we, as we age and get older, that this is, there's just so many beautiful things to look forward to. When you say you can wake up in the morning and do what you want with your time. I'm like, tell me more. This oh, exactly. Incredible. I yeah. can't be with you. Uh, well, one thing I want to say too is you will, you will be able to enjoy it because at some point, uh, most of the women I know lose interest in those cultural scripts. And, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about invisibility that you hear probably. Yeah. Well, that's actually has a, has a positive side, yeah. which is when, when you're invisible, you don't have to try so hard to make people happy and you have more freedom to define yourself because nobody cares how you define yourself. And so there's a, there's a a freedom Mm. that comes with, with letting go of some Mm. of the things that, that you're probably a little afraid of letting go of in some Mm. ways. The other thing I very much believe is we all find what we're looking for. And if what we're looking for is joy and love and kindness and beauty and laughter that's what we find, you know? And so it's very important. Uh, like I do this every morning, I wake up, I have some coffee, I sit and think for about half an hour. And mm-hmm. that thinking has to do with setting my intention for the day, 
with thinking how to build a good day with with the right elements in it. With um, one thing I've really learned is sometimes I'll be facing an appointment or event and my reaction will be dread. Oh no, I have to do X or Y. And now I've learned to say, why do you anticipate that will be unpleasant? How do you know it will be unpleasant? Why don't you stay open to the possibility that even something that seems unpleasant may become pleasant if you're looking for the joy in that experience? Hmm. So there's, there's ways that you will learn to set your intention to very important part, I think, of, of growth mm-hmm. is, and this is something I start with teenage girls and, and I'm still working on, but it's a very important part of happiness. We know from the happiness research from all over the world that the one thing happiness everywhere on earth has in common, people, happy people, mm-hmm. is reasonable expectations. So, for example, if you expect that you're going to have five teenagers in the house for a holiday Mm. and there's not going to be any drama and everybody's going to get along just great and things are Mm. going to flow smoothly, Uh you are really going to be disappointed because it's never going to happen that way. But if you expect, well, there'll probably be at least three meltdowns and somebody (laughs) will get mad at me. Then if you have less than three meltdowns and and nobody gets (laughs) mad at you, you've had a good holiday, you know. It's so true. Um, Like you've been spying on me. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I've been a mom. Yeah, that's right. All right, listen up. I have a brand new me course on sex that's out now and it is fire. Look, I don't care if you're single, married, mingling, whatever. You, You do you. It doesn't matter because this course is for all of us. Because who among us doesn't want to improve our sex life? We all do, right? So for this course, our sexpert, if you will, Dr. Celeste Holbrook is here. And you are going to absolutely fangirl her so hard. She's a sexologist who has so much real life wisdom and practical tips and takeaways and more. So we talk about real steps you can take to improve sex for you. We delve into discovery. Celeste calls it the erotic sandbox. You'll see. (laughs) We've got some ideas for things you might want to try. We also talk about the sexual narratives we may have been given or frankly not given and how they might still be affecting us now, like the lack of sex ed maybe or tons of shame or even purity culture. So we're going to unravel some of that and get to the core of how it may be impacting us today. We also talk about understanding ways to create satisfying sexual experiences for those in long-term partnerships and so much more, you guys. It is just so, so, so good. The sex course is out now. So head over to mecourse.org slash love 101. (laughs) That's mecourse.org slash love 101 to learn more and register. You wrote, our ultimate goal is to find the love we need within our own hearts. That way, as we approach the end of our lives, no matter what is happening, we will find ourselves walking in light. I think this is a really big idea, really important, one that my generation is just now wrestling with and grappling with and trying to learn and trying to teach our daughters at a younger age Um, Can you talk more about that and how vital this is? You know, it's interesting. I I think it's really important to have within oneself a sort of a a center and an inner light uh, that that's burning no matter what's going on. But it also, it comes with, it comes with time. You know, I don't think you can teach a 10 year old to be wise. I I don't think it's the life stage for wisdom, Mm -hmm. but, uh, one way I wrote about this in my in my book, A Life in Light, was I'm a very attachment-seeking person. I love hugging people. I love being in a room with 50 friends. I'm very close to people. I have a lot of friends. I've lived in the same town 50 years, and I have my activist friends and my writer friends and my neighbors and my kids' friends' friends and so on. And uh, 
And for that reason, by the way, COVID was really hard on me. Mm. But I spent I spent um, probably the first six, six decades of my life uh, attaching, finding more and more ways to have more and more people I loved in my life. Well, at this stage in my life, my family, some of them are dying. Uh, my mm. friends are dying or moving to the Sun Belt. Um, there's a lot of loss in this stage. And so one of the goals of this life stage is learning to detach and learning to let go and acceptance of the fact that the world will not be as peopled uh, as it was before, that I won't be as connected, for example, to my grandchildren who were very connected to me when they were cute little five-year-olds or less connected to me when they're 21-year-olds and so on. Uh, and that means that the light I find is not in other people's eyes. It's mm -hmm. got to be in my own heart. It's got to keep be in my own heart. And that light, um, that light, happiness, in my opinion, is very much a matter of attitude and a set of skills. Mm -hmm. So part of it is saying, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to look for that light within my heart. Part of it is saying, I have the skills to be happy. Mm -hmm. I know how to be kind to people. I know how to control my own reactivity. I know how to have reasonable expectations. One of the quotes I love very much, I put in at least two of my books is, I get what I want, but I know what to want. Mm -hmm. It's a very important quote. Another story about that is an old woman I met named Jane Jarvis, a jazz musician been very famous jazz musician, traveled the world during her life. But when she was very old, I went to visit her in a tiny little apartment in New York. And she was bed fast. She had a woman come in to help her a few hours a day. And she was laughing. She was having a great time with me. But at one point I asked, Jane, are, are, you, are you happy here? Are you doing okay? Because she had even no view. She had a window, but it looked onto a wall. Hmm. And she said, Mary, I have everything I need to be happy right between my ears. Hmm. And so it's kind of a matter of right between my ears. That's it. I mean, that's at the core of the, of the story. Um, yeah. That'll see us through because life is impermanent and everything changes and including ourselves and our bodies and our circumstances and our relationships and our stage of life. And so that's the one thing that no one can take, you know, that can't be stripped away from us no matter. And so, oh, I'm wanting to learn that. I want to learn that now. Uh, I'd love to take that with me through this next phase um, where I am. I, I, my, my days and months are marked by change right now. And Absolutely. every other year, a new kid launches out of this house. Everything is different right now. There is not, there's not one month the same as the month before. And so, um, that steady love in our own hearts, light in our own like bodies and souls feels comforting. That feels really comforting. That'll see us through. Um, I am so grateful for you and for your work. I, I thank you for pioneering what you have pioneered for girls and for women and, Thank you for trusting your keen powers of observation and your skill set over what the cultural narrative was enough to stick with it. Um, that was a brave move and countercultural and probably a little lonely. Um, and so, you know, we get to come behind you grateful uh, having now, now these are, these are conversations we hear all the time. And a lot of people are following in your footsteps in terms of their like work and their academia and they're just bringing data to bear and research. And it makes me feel so excited for the next generation who they're going to come up in this. This is their, this is the way they understand the world. Um, I know. And I know. so it's so, I'm so excited for them to not have to undo as much as we do. Mm -hmm. um, and relearn as much as we have to relearn, which is hard. It's hard to do it. That's real I deep know. in our bones. I know. Um, so yeah, it's going to be forever your legacy and it's incredible and something to be so proud of. And 
and we are certainly grateful for it. Can you just um, I have one last question for you, but before I ask it, can you please tell my listeners, because they're going to want to know it, where they can best find you? Because you have a lot, you have a huge body of work here um, and lots to learn from. We scratch the surface here. And so can you tell them where to find your work, everything about you really? Right. Well, I've got a website like everyone else, and it's marypiefer.com, and Pfeiffer's P-I-P-H-E-R. Uh, so that's the best place. And my books are all over the place. They're in libraries and bookstores. Last question. And this is a question that I actually ask all my guests. And I borrowed this from another woman who's about your age. And she is just a, a mentor from afar. She's a Episcopal priest. And her question is, and please, by all means, Mary, answer this however you want to answer it, just as earnestly or as absurdly as you want to. We get every kind of answer. But the question is, what is saving your life right now? Yeah, it's a beautiful question. Living in Nebraska, where at low population density, I mean, it's all just a prairie as it was a prairie 200 years ago. I really, I love being outside, love being in the natural world. Those are the things that saved me. Perfect. Perfect and beautiful. Um, thank you once again for your time today, for your work, thank for you, your Jen. wisdom. Um, I am thrilled to introduce you to my community who doesn't know you. And we will link up everything to your work and to your website, to your books, everything for my readers so they can find you easily. Um, delighted to have met you. Thank you for being on today. All right, you guys, so much more to come in this series. I am so personally looking forward to hosting these conversations, definitely for you and for the community, but honestly, for me too. This is exactly where I'm at. Um, Mary has so much content, so many good resources for us. So as mentioned, I will link over at jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, everything about this episode, show notes, all of her website, her books, everything. Um, and so you can go over there for a one-stop shop. Um, <clears throat> you're not going to want to miss any episode in this series. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, do it. Just hit the subscribe button and they'll all just, boom, show up in your library, populated without you having to do a single thing for it. Um, and then you can listen to these as you have time. Also, if you ever want to watch them, go over to YouTube. We have an, a visual recording of every single podcast where you get to watch us have a conversation, which, of course, I find that's the very best way because that's how I experience it. I get to look at my guest and um, relate to them sort of in a physical way. So that's always there for you, too. All right, you guys. See you next week.